If someone told you that they live by faith, what would you think? What do you think they mean by that? They're going to live by faith or they are living by faith. Would you think that they were kind of like John the Baptist living out in the middle of nowhere, eating uh, honey and locusts and wearing scratchy clothes? Is, is that living by faith? Maybe it's like Elijah who waited around till the ravens brought him food and God whispered to him. I'm not sure that that's the only way or those are the only ways to live by faith, but um, that's what kind of came to my mind. But a lot of times in our world today, when someone says they live by faith, it's somewhat aspirational. In other words, they strive to live more by faith because that's part of our growth as believers, part of our growth as Christians, part of our growth in worshiping God, serving God, growing in him, all these kind of things. And part of our growth in understanding what God does, what he expects, what he wants to be true in our lives for our benefit as well as our witness. What would be different about your life if you desired to live more by faith? What would change in your attitude? What would change in the way that you deal with this world, with uh, um, possessions and belongings and money and, and things like that? Um, what would change in the way that you look at your future on this earth, in the way that you serve God? Well, I hope that we can say, I live by faith. And I hope that, that we are growing in that direction because growing in that direction shows that God is in us more and more every day. I'm assuming that every Christian wants to live by faith, hopefully in larger and larger amounts. Let's take a look at Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, that one scripture is more of a series than a sermon, and uh, but we're going we're gonna to start with this because you may have noticed in here that Paul says, I live by faith, the life I now live in the body. But he acknowledges that his life is no longer his own. Uh, he no longer lives means that he surrendered himself. And when we come to Christ, we have to die to self and die to sin. And then we're, when we're baptized into Christ, we're buried with him. And the picture of being buried is going under the water and when we're raised up to a new life, now, as I said, we've died to sin and self. And sometimes we don't bury them deeply enough and really look only to Christ. But that's part of that growth, part of that, that better understanding as we move forward. So when Paul talks about the life in this body, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God because Jesus has given me everything that I need for this life and eternity. Well, what's the context here? Paul is writing to churches and Christians in the region of Galatia. This is not just one church, um, but uh, they're in what is today Turkey, in the southern part, maybe south central, I guess we could say, that uh, there were a series of churches that were having some real struggles. They had some of the Jewish Christians come, apparently from Judea, Jerusalem area, and they came and they told the Gentile Christians that you have to become Jews before you can really become Christians. And I believe that at least initially, that they were striving for the very best for these new Christians. That if you become Jewish, that you'll understand the Passover, you'll understand the sacrifice system, you'll understand you know, the holy days and holidays and, and the way God works and his miracles. The problem was that they were putting on the backs of these new Christians, things that they themselves had never been able to live up to. Because none of us can keep the law perfectly, therefore the law doesn't justify us, but condemns us. And these new Christians, the more they understood about the law, the more they were going to get that. And Paul even says in Romans 7 that the law was there to show him that he was a sinner and he needed to repent. And so Paul is going to instruct these Christians, and he's going to speak very harshly about the people that, uh, that are trying to persuade them that uh, to be really part of the covenant, they, the, the men had to be circumcised, for example, uh, and they, they had to keep these other laws. And Paul obviously says that that's not the way it's supposed to be. The main thing 
is that you cannot gain favor from God by keeping the Old Testament law, keeping the Ten Commandments, the dietary laws, um, the 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 fiestas or the feasts in the holy days. I can't read my own writing sometimes, but fiesta would be more Mexican than Galatia. But anyways, uh, circumcision, wearing funny hats, all these kinds of things. They won't save you. They will just drag you down. And uh, they dealt with this in Acts chapter 15, by the way. And they dealt with it a little bit in, in Acts chapter 10 when Peter had gone to preach to Cornelius and the people who were in his household. And, uh, and so this has come up in the church a number of times, a number of ways. Only, only Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection will bring us to our Heavenly Father. We need his righteousness because righteousness comes by belonging completely to Jesus. We want to live by faith. So what would change in my life? What would happen in my life if I live by faith? What would happen in your life if you live by faith? Well, let's take a look at, at five or six or seven things here, depending on how much time we have. Number one, if we live by faith, we will have more peace and less worry. Now, it's not that instantly all of our problems go away. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, no. Because a lot of times when people have such a wonderful life, they forget about God. When we have an easy life, we don't grow in him. We, we don't do the things that will, will draw us near to him. Um, one important thing about this, when we walk by faith or live by faith, is that we know we never walk alone. And that when we go through the struggles and the trials, we know that God is with us, that his spirit is helping us. We can go to his word and seek his truth about our situations in life. And when we use the Bible and live by the spirit, then we have the opportunity to really grow and that peace comes to us. Um, some years ago, I heard about a gymnast. Uh, she went to the Olympics. Her name was Sean Johnson. And uh, she was part of one of the greatest gymnastic teams in all of Olympic history uh, and, and U.S. history. Sean Johnson had a lot of problems in her life. Um, she had an eating disorder. She had depression and distress. She had injuries, all kinds of things that came into her life. But because she was a believer, that she overcame so much of that and not just overcome from the standpoint of getting back into gymnastics. She, she certainly did that, but overcame from the standpoint of having the peace that passes understanding. Part of it is knowing that this life is not the only thing, that this life is not the most important thing or the main thing. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Philippians chapter 4 is a passage I just referenced. Rejoice in the Lord always, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He starts with rejoicing. Now, rejoicing comes from having joy. Joy is from having Jesus inside. It's different than happiness. Happiness comes from what happens. There are a whole lot of things in this world that don't make us happy. At least they shouldn't. But in this world, even in the spiritual battle, even in the struggles in life, we can have joy. And when we have that joy, then we have gentleness because we see how near the Lord is. And I'm not going to read back through all of this, but we have the opportunity not to be as anxious. And I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of people that over the last year, 13 months, whatever, there's been a lot of anxiety. There have been a lot of people who have been lonely and, and uh, distressed and depressed. And it, hopefully you have grown in your walk with the Lord. Hopefully you've talked with him and uh, recently um, in our church, we sang the song in the garden and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. We never knew that God's name was Andy till that song was written. Okay, that's a bad joke. But anyways, uh, to have the peace that passes understanding is huge. 
Well, how about something else? How about 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 through 10? Usually when we think about this passage, we think about how money is the root of all evil. Well, that's a lie. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. But look at what Paul says to Timothy. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. That's where that comes from. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Ouch. I think that's kind of difficult for us to get to that point. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Well, it's not just money. Money represents security for a lot of people. Money represents uh, advantage or power or control. Money represents um, success and uh, for a lot of people. They feel like they, they need to show the world that they're better than most other people or better than others in their family or, or in their neighborhood or whatever. But that's not what Paul says to Timothy, that if we have contentment, honestly, that'll set you apart also from all these other people. If you have contentment in Christ, if you put your trust in him, whether you have lots of money or no money, whether you have lots of security or no security in this world, Instead, find your security in Christ. Then you can have peace. The peace that passes understanding. Then we have less worry. Well, secondly, if we live by faith, we will have a stronger sense of forgiveness. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be wonderful? The past should not haunt us if we are living by faith. And, and quite often, we, we talk about forgiveness but we forget how strong it is in our lives when we hold a grudge. For some people, they even get to a point where their, their anger, their hurt uh, come to define them. And to me, that's tragic because what that means is that you always want to have this emotional edge that, that is not from God. But instead, it is, it is protecting yourself it is, it is keeping you in a position of control over circumstances and over others. And, and I understand, once we've been hurt deeply, we never want to be hurt like that again. I get that. But if we want to receive forgiveness from God, and I'm talking about truly receiving it, not just lip service to it. But if we truly receive forgiveness from God, then it's going to include forgiving others. And honestly, that's what's best. That's what's going to help us in our walk with him and our walk in this world. It's what's going to help us have more peace and less worry, as we've already talked about. God forgives us. We forgive others. We blew it many times. I can tell you about some mistakes that I've made in my life. We're not going to take time to go there today because this message is more about the Lord and not really about me, but it's about the way you and I relate to God and interact Forgiveness is very, very important if we're going to have joy. Um, Ephesians 4.32 is the end of a very amazing passage. But Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Uh, I, I think about the parable that Jesus told uh, about uh, a man who owed him uh, tons, uh, a man who owed, owed the master tons and tons of money. Uh, we'll just say $50 million just to be a lot of money. I hope that's still a lot of money. Um, and, and the, but the master forgave him. But when he walked outside, he found a man who owed him a hundred bucks, putting it in today's terms. And he refused to forgive the man the hundred dollars, even though the master had forgiven him 50 million. That was a problem. When I look at my life, the things that people have done to me, well, sometimes they're bad, especially at that moment. But what I've done and the forgiveness that I've needed from my Heavenly Father is so much more. And so I want to forgive others. I want them, at the very least, to have a sense that, that God is in this world. And if he's working through me in this small way, that's, that's great. But if we're going to live by faith, we're going to do things God's way. We're going to put our trust in him. And when he says, forgive you know, forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. 
back to Ephesians 4.32. Wow. We can, we can represent Jesus to the world. Well, if we live by faith, then we will have a stronger desire to show our faith with others. If I live by faith, I have something to share. I look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, Paul says. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy statement that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example to those who would believe in him, receive eternal life. So, we forgive others because we've received forgiveness from, from God. Number four, uh, if we live by faith, we will have a stronger sense of heaven. Floating through this life, we may go days or weeks or months or years without thinking about heaven and eternal life. It, it's one of the, the good and the bad parts of this life. We are so incredibly blessed, most of us, that we don't need to think about eternity, or do we? Quite often, we just kind of pay attention to this life. It's important for us to read the scripture and to see the places where eternal life is spoken about. Sometimes we are afraid to look at the book of Revelation because we don't understand it or we think we don't. But Revelation speaks about last things, about eternity in many of its chapters. Jesus came to die so that we could have eternal life. And so we have more of a sense of heaven. If we live by faith, number five, my, my life will be in God's hands. We live like the theory of, uh, we, we like the theory of this, don't we? My life is in God's hands, but not always the reality. So many times, uh, we well, if we pray or when we pray, we pray like it depends on God and we live like it depends on us. But you know, it still depends on God. And so when we live by faith, now I, I'm not saying that we should sit back and do nothing. Obviously, that's not God's way. But if we're working to try to prove that we're saved or if we're working because we want to get farther than, than anybody else, then we're making mistakes. We have to be careful not to take back control of our, our lives because when we die to self, then we need to surrender ourselves to Christ. Number six, when we live by faith, we will be less concerned about money, job, possessions, health, family, things like that. The things of this world become less important because we have the Lord and his promises. Now, we want to share the Lord with others around us. We want to share the wealth that he entrusts to us. And we might be able to give the widow's might <laughs> at church, or we might not be able to leave anything for our family. Hopefully we can. But when we live by faith, we trust that God will make enough what we have, what he's given to us. You know, it's, it's easier to give when we live by faith. And I uh, heard a discussion recently, people saying, well, it's okay if you don't give money to church. Why? Well, I, I can't tell you whether that's right or not. But what I see is that people who live by faith put their trust in him. And as I said, even if they give the widow's might, even if they give very small amounts by the world's standards, if they're making a sacrifice to be obedient to him and to show love for him, that's so very important. What I think about uh, Luke 6.38, people who don't give, and again, that might be not just in church, but to, to bless others as well. But look what Jesus says about giving. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He almost makes it sound like if you don't give that God can't bless you as much or in the same way. Something to think about, isn't it? But our desire shouldn't be to, to give so we can get rich but it expresses our trust in him, and that's living by faith. We need to, to help his kingdom grow ahead of our own. Number six, if we live by faith, we will have less concern about, oh, I'm, uh, that's a continuation here, isn't it? Um, one more thing. When we live by faith, our priorities are different. 
No longer should the big house, the fast car, the corner office, the big bank account, the trophy wife, etc. See, I got love. I got lucky. I got the trophy wife the first time around. But um, you know, some of you guys aren't as lucky that way, I suppose. Um, but those things should not be the measure of our lives. It should be our our love for God and our understanding of Him. Living by faith means seeing people and things differently, seeing seeing people and things through God's eyes, not our own. Living by faith means that we will desire more righteousness. And again, this is usually a growth thing. Usually when someone comes to Christ, all of their situations don't resolve themselves. All their situations don't immediately go away. And so we want to, to walk with him and we want to honor him and, and, and let people realize how important he is. Um, Colossians 1 says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Live a life, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Let the world see him in you more and more every day. That doesn't mean that you'll never have a time that the wrong word slips or or that uh, you get angry about something and, and you know you just had talked with the Lord about helping you get past that. But it's important for us to live by faith and let that show in our lives. Well, I can keep the law 99.45% of the time and I'm still not getting in, into heaven because of my good works. We all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. But remember, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. May we also love him and give ourselves up for him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to live by faith. Help us, Father, to put our trust more completely in you every day, to have that perspective of heaven and forgiveness, and to know that, that Jesus is in us. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a great Monday.